Hello and welcome to Straight Talk with me, Sefiso Masang. At Straight Talk, I aim to bring you the answers to controversial questions. I speak to leaders of business, controversial figures, eminent persons, the person on the street, and leaders that walk the South African soil. It's very true that the growth of de developing businesses in this country is just what this economy needs. But this economy is not in the hands of the masses. It's not in the hands of African people. Today I'm seated with a great leader, the Minister of Small Business Development, and a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC, Ms. Lindy Wezul. Stay tuned. This is Straight Talk. Ms. Zulu, I welcome you to the show. It's very good to have you. Thank you, Sviso. I hope I'm not controversial. I hope so, too. But I heard uh, you talking about controversial people. And, and leaders and uh, eminent persons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very good to have you, uh, you, particularly in the 23rd year of our democracy, in the 105th year of the ANC's birthday. Um, it's good for me to have you and speak to a woman, uh, particularly because we're hoping for a female leader in the future of South Africa. Let me start there, ma'am. Don't you think South Africa is ready for a female president? Well, the women of South Africa have said for a very long time that uh, South Africa is ready for a, a woman president. If I may say that um, our liberation struggle itself Prompt, put us women at the forefront and therefore being in the forefront also means that we have been able to go through the trials and tribulations of a political life and therefore South African people have seen the capacity and capability of South African women in general in being part and parcel of um, decision-making structures of this country, including in the political space. And I think that South Africa is ready for a woman president. Ma'am, if you had to choose who that uh, woman president is, I know we are before your elective conference, but if you had to, to throw some hats in, uh, who, would, who would be your operative leader? Well, I can't be throwing hats in it because, you know, the African National Congress has got its own processes. You don't wake up and say, I'm ready to be the president of uh, the African National Congress and the country. The structures and the processes in the ANC are very clear and they are enshrined in the constitution of the African National Congress. It is always the members of the branches who would decide who has to be that person. The pool is big, big enough for um, the branches to decide who they want. And, and by the way, when the branches decide who they want, they have processes of selecting those individuals because it won't be just one individual. They've got a process of selecting a few individuals. And there is an electoral process of the ANC, which is an old aid an old age uh, uh, process of the African National Congress. Would so we'll you, wait for that time. Would you like to be elected by a certain ward? Are you hoping to, to be elected? Have you got some presidential aspirations yourself? <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't be the one to say that. I mean, it, like I say to you, it's, it's the branches that will decide. And by the way, let's also just go back to the fact that branches would decide on who they want to be any position because i mean we tend to be confining ourselves only to the issue of the president and yet um the the, the selection process of the african national congress is quite wide and therefore people will decide on a number of people who they want to be in the leadership position um the top six for instance and all other members that follow thereafter I, I just think that um, members of the African National Congress know exactly what they're looking for when they select uh, leaders of the African National Congress. Let me turn my attention to, to the ANC. Um, last week, uh, you were at Lutuli House, and the ANC released its uh, policy documents mm. uh, leading up to 2019. Is there a shift in the ANC? Is there a redefinition in the patterns, or have you taken group 
of the fact that you've lost some metros mm -hmm. or that the, the ANC in its factional battle has uh, almost broken or disintegrated. Is this new policy idea a new way of uh, connecting the, the ANC that seems so, so broken within the factions? Look, let me start with this whole issue of, fa of factions. Factions in the African National Congress are, are a very unfortunate phenomenon. And what is important for the leaders of the African National Congress, but together with the ordinary members, we have to do everything we can to make sure that we reverse this whole thing of factionalism because it's distracting us from the real uh, uh, challenge that faces the African National Congress. And the real challenge that faces the African National Congress is the transformation of South Africa, both politically, socially, and economically. And we have said already that the biggest challenge that South Africa faces today is mm. that of economic transformation. Now, the ANC as an organization and members of the African National Congress, we really cannot be bickering over small issues of fighting over leadership positions because mm. then we, distract, uh, we detract ourselves from the main issue. But more than anything else, we actually put ourselves in the hands of the enemy. The enemy is still out there ensuring that the ANC breaks down. And if we allow ourselves to be in these uh, factions and groups, it means we are empowering uh, uh, that enemy that wants to see a broken ANC. But I personally am confident that the African mm -hmm. National Congress and its long history, it has gone through mm -hmm. these challenges before in different ways. But of course, it wasn't uh, under democracy, even during the liberation struggle. The ANC faced quite a lot of challenges, which were more internal challenges. But because the ANC itself is very dynamic, mm. the ANC itself looks at the fact that there's a new environment at all times, mm. at, at all historical times. There's always something new that comes through. So how do we then uh, fit ourselves into developing uh, systems and, and policies that will enable us to survive the current challenges, which are much broader than just the challenges facing the ANC. I like your description of the ANC still facing the enemy, or this constitutional democracy facing an enemy. Mm -hmm. Who is this enemy that we're talking about? The enemy is those that are fighting against transformation. Anyone who stands on the way of transformation, when you understand very well why we are calling for transformation, and in particular now calling for radical economic transformation, those are the people that I would term enemy. Because look, I'm used to using the term enemy because I come from that school of thought where we were in a liberation struggle and we were fighting an enemy which was the apartheid regime. The enemy today is poverty, unemployment, inequality, and the resistance to transforming the economy of South Africa to be in the hands of the majority of South Africans. This is a black country, by the way. There are people who mm. came from wherever they came, colonized the country, made it impossible mm. for us as black people to be seen as people that could have a capacity and capability of building our own country. But hey, we struggled, we negotiated, we found ourselves where we are today. All we are saying is, don't be an enemy of transformation, because if you become an enemy of transformation, we will do exactly the same things that we did in the past to make sure that the change that we want to see in South Africa happens. That sounds like a very militant approach, uh, Minister, to, to, to transformation. And often in, in, in the political school, mm -hmm. we define the ANC pre-democracy as a radical movement mm. and perhaps post-democracy as a state. But by your description, you sound very militant. Is I will it... always be militant because I believe that if we need to, the, to see the change happening, mm. you know, look, we wouldn't be militant if from the very beginning, do, during the negotiations, there was a common understanding, as the Freedom Charter says, that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And therefore, all the other clauses in the in 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 the in, in all the clauses of the Freedom Charter needed to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And there was a common understanding from the very beginning that we are collectively, as South Africans, black and white, we collectively have to face the responsibility of transforming this country. But what is it that happened? 
What happened was that everything ended up remaining within the government for transformation. Transformation cannot be something that has to be done by government alone. We've got um, civil society, we've got our communities, we've got the private sector, we've got government, we've got all sectors of society who need to pull together to make sure that transformation happens. But my personal belief is that what the private sector has done in order for us to move into the transformation of ensuring that the ownership of the means of production in South Africa, the structure of the economy of South Africa is in such a way that it empowers black people to also find themselves in the mainstream of, of the economy of South Africa has always remained like it's the responsibility of government. Mm -hmm. I cannot um, uh, uh, do anything else but to remain militant because the only way you can be able to transform this country is to continue being militant. But your militant, my militancy and all my other comrades' militancy doesn't mean we're going to go out there and be destructive and be anything. It's just mm -hmm. that the same way that we took a decision to join a liberation struggle and fight for all those years cannot be stopped right now. Because right now, who's facing poverty is a black person. Who is forcing, who's facing inequality is the black person. Who is facing all the greater challenges of really being just a community and a society is still black people. And who's trying their best to try and meet uh, the, those and, and try and change that? It still remains the government. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying, um, please don't dampen my, military, my mili militant uh, approach to some of these things mm -hmm. because I think that it's important for mm -hmm. us to do that. Minister, the, the ANC has... Uh, coming up with a new vetting process that uh, needs certain credentials, and they call them merits, before uh, an individual can ascend into ANC positions. Mm -hmm. But by the nature of democracy itself, democracy means that the people can elect whomever they please, and that person can ascend, they give that person a mandate, and that person represents them at uh, party structures, uh, within the executive, if they will. Doesn't this new process uh, abolish the, the, the democratic processions that the people believe in? Not really. You see, even at the level of selecting who, a, a, a comrade at any level, there are guidelines towards that. You, you, you cannot elect somebody into the structures of the African National Congress when that person does not believe mm. in what the African National Congress But Minister, is. who am I to, to suggest that somebody needs certain merits? Isn't that, that process in itself uh, an obstruction to, to no. democracy? Because mm. I can become a gatekeeper and say, I don't want this person, I don't want this person. The people say, we want Ms. Lindwe Zulu. And I can stand there as a gatekeeper and say, well, I don't like her, she's not fit to come in. I don't there think are guidelines. that's a system of fairness. No, they, it is fairness. It is fair. There are always guidelines in the African National Congress. Firstly, you should have proved yourself within the structures of the African National Congress first. That firstly, you understand what the African National Congress stands for. Secondly, you must be a tried and tested leader of the African National Congress to be able to carry the responsibility of leadership within the African National Congress. Thirdly, you must also be respected by the community and the environment in which you live in. Because look, we cannot be electing people into positions when firstly they're not ready for those positions, when secondly we know perfectly well they don't have what it takes to be leaders in those positions. That's the reason why the African National Congress, through the experience of the past 23 years uh, in government, but also as, a, as an organization, building itself in a new environment. Because let's separate this. The ANC is building itself in a new environment post-liberation struggle, from armed struggle, from being in prison. We're building ourselves anew. We are also looking at the current environment and saying, do our systems now assist us in ensuring that we elect leaders who are going to be able to withstand whatever challenges are there. But more than anything else, we are electing leaders who are going to be able to carry the agenda of transformation into the next level. Concerned that 
this process may be violated because of also the factionalist agendas within the party right now. Someone may say, this comrade that is being elected does not have the same ideological content I have, or they don't come from the same factionalist division as I am. And they can strangle the process of leaders that the people elect, and then it does not become democratic. Because as much as we say, you know, the process will be well, that, that process will be guarded by people and not angels. Comrades, these are comrades you're talking about. We're not just talking about uh, uh, people in general outside. You're talking about ANC members who are steeped, who are supposedly supposed to be ones who understand mm. the constitution of, of the ANC, the practices of the ANC. These are comrades who are expected to put that first. What is the ANC? What is the ANC about? Even as the party progresses and grows to the new model, uh, 2019 and beyond, isn't it a factionalist move that even parliament itself is divided on the issue of land? When the president has said uh, the people shall inherit land, when Mr. Malema said, I will give you 6%, in order to amend the constitution so that there can be expropriation of land uh, without compensation. But it looks like even caucus or the ANC in parliament is divided on the issue of expropriation of land. There are them that say expropri expropriation of land should be given without compensation. There are those who don't even seem to believe within the ANC that the people must get their land back. That's, the, that's a very deep conflict of ideology, even within the ANC in Parliament. No, I don't think we should be, we, we, we should be looking at um, a caucus being divided on this issue. There is no division in this issue. It's about the policy of the African National Congress and what does the policy say. Land has to be given back to its rightful owners. However, in that context, we agree also that this must be done in an orderly fashion. We also agree that we've got a constitution in South Africa. Mm -hmm. We also agree, as uh, Comrade Naledi clearly uh, said in Parliament in the last week, that changing a constitution or a clause in the constitution might not necessarily resolve the issue because the constitution is interrelated and interlinked. So you can't be... Uh, opt opportunistic about it and say you're just going to go in there and just change that clause because the clause that you change has got an impact on other clauses within the constitution. For the African National Congress, is, it is this straight. 23 years of democracy, there are certain uh, decisions that we took, for instance, mm. willing buyer, willing seller, which we can now see clearly. While we took, that yes, we took that decision with good intentions. Mm. We always take decisions with good intentions. But we realize that that good intention did not gain the same intention on the other side because so many people have said that the land, the price was, was hiked by those who were willing to sell. And, and secondly, we've come to the conclusion, willing buyer, willing seller is not going to work. Let's look for other means, but within the confines of the Constitution. Secondly, when you take the land, you've got to be very clear that you have a plan for that land. Is it for residential? And if it's for residential, what are you going to do? Are you going to be the one to assist in assisting communities to build their houses? Or are you taking the land for purposes of food production and all? You've got to have a plan in hand. Lastly, we, can, we cannot be anarchic about the way we, we take the land. Even with the one that we take without compensation, we still cannot be anarchic because, believe me, we belong to the global world. We still mm -hmm. want investors to come into South Africa. We still want South Africans themselves having the confidence that when the land is taken, it shall also be distributed equally and fairly without any corruption in there. So as a responsible government mm -hmm. of the African National Congress, we, we can feel the yearning and the hunger 
for the land. And we are engaging with our people to say, yes, the land has to be given back uh, to our people, mm. but it's got to be in an orderly fashion. Minister, will you then agree that there are some people within the ANC who don't believe in expropriation of land? And maybe that is why there has been such a delay in expropriating land, because people are sitting after 23 years and the promises have been made, but there are no deliveries, particularly when it comes to the issue of land. There can never be people in the African National Congress who really truly believe in the aspirations of black people and economic transformation who would be against the land being given back to its people. I don't believe that such people exist in the African National Congress. If they do, maybe it might be people who now have found themselves with a particular mm. personal interest, which will be very unfortunate because we cannot be mm. taking policy positions on the basis of our po mm. personal Mr. preferences. Mr. Derek Hanekom yes. doesn't agree with your stance on land, Minister. I follow his tweets and he's got a very different ideology and a different mindset when dealing with land. Well, unfortunately, I haven't looked into his tweets. If that's what you see in his tweets, it will be very unfortunate because I personally firmly believe you cannot use your personal background, your personal interest in the issue of land being given back to black people. That will be very unfortunate, and I think that uh, we can have the conversation with him because I'm not thinking that he should be moving from a point of view of his own personal feeling. Because, look... If all of us were to go according to our own personal feeling, mm. then we will get back to this whole thing of people grabbing the land and taking the land anyhow. Because what they would put in the front is that this is our land mm. anyway, uh, so let's take it. But my belief and the belief of the African National Congress is that if we want South Africa to be respected in the, in the, in the, in the, in the world, mm. if we want South Africa to be seen to be a country of law and order, it means we've got to be able to follow our own systems and our own processes. And where we see that we've put a system in place that's not working, it's made by us. Mm -hmm. Let's change it. But one of the things that we cannot afford as a country, even for our own citizens, we cannot afford anarchy. We've got to make sure that everything is done properly. Minister, let me draw your attention to the issue of collusion. Um, the Competition Commission has released its report. Mm -hmm. Banks have colluded. Um, this has affected uh, black people in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. It has affected uh, small business owners, mm -hmm. SMMEs. Which direction are you taking as the Minister of Small Business Development? As a minister, actually, I am perturbed by the fact that collusion continues and it has to take a, a, a structure like the, 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 the competition commission, well, it's their responsibility anyway to do that. But just to discover and realize that still uh, big banks and, 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 and those that still own the means of production and everything in South Africa, that despite the olive branch that this government of the African National Congress is always giving to them to say, this country belongs to all of us. Let us all take responsibility of ensuring that transformation happens. And you come across mm. this, it's an indictment actually on them. Why do they have to do something like that, knowing perfectly well that this is a very short period of transformation uh, as a country? And I think, that, I think that it's good in South Africa that we have institutions mm. like the Competition Commission. And my view is that we should strengthen the arm of the, uh, uh, the commission. We must make sure that it's got the necessary resources and human, uh, and, and, and human resource to make sure that it keeps on unearthing this. But what do you do thereafter? For me, that's mm. what is important. How are and you for going me, to protect uh, small business owners, black business owners who are affected by collusion, the price of bread goes up, the price of fuel goes up. How do you protect them? The punishment that is meted on these people who are colluding, others say, why do you call it collusion instead of uh, a corruption? And I agree yeah. with that. Why do you call it, uh, not call it fraud, you know, as a criminal offense? Well, uh, I think it, it, is, it, it is within the, 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 the law that that can be looked into, mm -hmm. whether there was fraud in there. Because what then needs to happen is that for those who feel that there is fraud in it, there has to be certain processes. Again, 
we are in a country of rule of law. We must never, ever at any point think that we can do anything anyhow that we want. The reason why we've got the laws, the regulations and everything is for us to be able to say now that the, these people have been found to be colluding and the Competition Commission finds them, they have to mm. pay that fine. But for me, it's beyond just payment of fine. Because yes. I feel that these people have got big pockets. You find them, they go they around. They decide and what then the they, fine and should then, be. No, they also they say we're going to make up our money anyway. We still mm. have to find a way of recovering uh, our money. But worst of all is when they still believe that after having been fined, it's up to them to say how that fine, that money has Will to be, be used. used. Mm. I don't believe in that. And, 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 and for, for, for us in the Department of Small Business Development, we look at this in a very serious light because that's one of the reasons we're talking about the, 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 the structure of the economy of South Africa. That's why we talk about the ownership of the means of production in South Africa. That's why we're saying in order for this country to be seen to be a black country at the end of the day, at the commanding heights of the economy of South Africa, there's got to be black people. And 22 years down the line, in my mm. space as a minister of small and medium enterprises, I'm just amazed at how many and so much of young people who have tried to lift themselves up, who now have a capacity. We've got engineers, we've got uh, accountants, we've got, we've got young black people who are now at a level of saying we are ready to take on on this uh, economy of South Africa. We are capable of being part and parcel of the bigger picture of the economy of South Africa. Uh, Minister, there is a, an Instagram picture mm -hmm. uh, circulating where you were with Mr. Brian Molefe, who mm -hmm. is now a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. And uh, the caption there said, uh, the time for change has come. Uh, the time for change uh, is here and uh, it's going to be a new season in, in parliament. Do you care to, to induct me on, on, on that post? And what well, you meant if, by if you that? Go, if you go back to that post, um, there's, there's not just that post. I was taking the trend of change from an economic point of view to say change must happen in South Africa and we can't wait too long for that change to happen. And that change I was talking about was how do we ensure that black people become part and parcel of owners of the means of production and so forth. And I see the arrival of uh, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Mulife into that space as bringing that change because his experience of where he comes from and the boosting of the capacity of members of parliament with that kind of an, of an experience, for me, I see it as something very positive. And besides, I was welcoming a comrade who through the normal processes in, of, of, of firstly the African National Congress, but also parliament itself, he was sworn in like any other. Actually, I was just also irritated by the fact that there's so much noise that's being made and so much attack on somebody who is mm. a member of the African National Congress who have proved himself of the capacity and capability, who have earned so much in terms of improving himself in ensuring that in the system of uh, governance he is capable. So I was welcoming a comrade and I still think that it is correct for him to be where, where he is right now. Oh, time is always my enemy, yes, Mazu. unfortunately. Yeah, thank you for coming. And it's not our last conversation. It shouldn't uh, be our last uh, conversation. We'll meet again. Uh, you've heard it for yourself, South Africa in the world. Um, I think the ANC did not win the economic power, but they won the political power to strive and fight for the economic emancipation of black people in this country. I've spoken to Malinde Wezulu, and I'm inspired that uh, black business may develop in this country. It won't be an easy journey. 105 years into the ANC's birth and 23 years into our democracy. If you're watching this right now, the best thing you can help us with is to pray for this country. I am Sefiso Mahlangu and this is Straight Talk. Thank you for watching. See you next time.